Nobody said a word for several minutes. It was a solemn sort of silence. Even the wind put on a stealthy, sinister quiet and made no more noise than the falling flakes of snow. Finally, a sad-voiced conversation began, and it was soon apparent that in each of our hearts lay the conviction that this was our last night with the living. I had so hoped that I was the only one who felt so. When the others calmly acknowledged their conviction, it sounded like the summons itself. Ollendorf said, <coughs> Brothers, let us die together, and let us go without one hard feeling towards each other. Let us forget and forgive bygones. I know that you have felt hard towards me for turning over the canoe and for knowing too much and leading you round and round in the snow. But I meant well, forgive me. I acknowledge freely that I had hard feelings against Mr. Abalu for abusing me and calling me a log rhythm, <laughs> which is a thing I do not know what but no doubt a thing considered disgraceful and unbecoming in America, and it has scarcely been out of my mind and has hurt me a great deal. But let it go. I forgive Mr. Ballou with all my heart, and poor Ollendorf broke down and the tears came. He was not alone, for I was crying too, and so was Mr. Ballou. Ollendorf got his voice again and forgave me for things I had done and said. <coughs> Then he got out his bottle of whiskey and said that whether he lived or died, he would never touch another drop. He has said he had given up all hope of life, and although ill-prepared, was ready to submit humbly to his fate, that he wished he could be spared a little longer, not for any selfish reason, but to make a thorough reform in his character and by devoting himself to helping the poor, nursing the sick, and pleading with the people to guard themselves against the evils of intemperance, make his life a beneficent example to the young, and lay it down at last with the precious reflection that it had not been lived in vain. He ended by saying that his reform should begin at this moment, even here in the presence of death, since no longer time was to be vouchsafed wherein to prosecute it, to man's help and benefit. And with that, he threw away the bottle of whiskey. Mr. Blue made remarks of similar purport and began the reform he could not live to continue by throwing away the ancient pack of cards that had solaced our captivity during the flood and made it bearable. He said he never gambled, but still was satisfied that the meddling with cards in any way was immoral and injurious, and no man could be wholly pure and blemishless without eschewing them. And therefore, continued he, in doing this act I already feel more in sympathy with that spiritual saturnalia necessary to entire and obsolete reform. <laughs> These rolling syllables touched him as no intelligent eloquence could have done, and the old man sobbed with a mournfulness not unmingled with satisfaction. My own remarks were of the same tenor as those of my comrades, and I know that the feelings that prompted them were heartfelt and sincere. We were all sincere and all deeply moved and earnest, for we were in the presence of death and without hope. I threw away my pipe, and in doing it felt that at last I was free of a hated vice, and one that had ridden me like a tyrant all my days. While I yet talked and thought of the good I might now do with these new incentives and higher and better aims to guide me, if I could only be spared a few years longer. 
overcame me, and the tears came again. We put our arms about each other's necks and awaited the wane, warning drowsiness that precedes death by freezing. It came stealing over us presently, and then we bade each other a last farewell. A delicious dreaminess wrought its web about my yielding senses, while the snowflakes wove a winding sheet about my conquered body. Oblivion came. The battle of life was done. Chapter 33, Return of Consciousness. Ridiculous developments, a station house, bitter feelings, fruits of repentance, resurrected vices. I do not know how long I was in a state of forgetfulness, but it seemed an age. A vague consciousness grew upon me by degrees, and then came a gathering anguish of pain in my limbs and through all my body. I shuddered. The thought filtered, flitted through my brain. This is death. This is the hereafter. Then came a white upheaval at my side, and a voice said with bitterness, Will some gentleman be so good as to kick me behind? It was Baloo. At least it was a tousled snow image in a sitting posture with Baloo's voice. I rose up. And there in the gray dawn, not 15 steps from us, were the frame buildings of a stage station. And under a shed stood our still saddled and bridled horses. An arched snow drift broke up now, and Allendorf emerged from it. And the three of us sat and stared at the houses without speaking a word. We really had nothing to say. We were like the profane man who could not do the subject justice. The whole situation was so painfully ridiculous and humiliating that words were tame and we did not know where to commence anyhow. The joy in our hearts at our deliverance was poisoned, well nigh dissipated indeed. We presently began to grow pettish by degrees and sullen and then angry at each other, angry at ourselves, angry at everything in general. We moodily dusted the snow from our clothing and in unsociable single file plowed our way to the horses, unsaddled them, and sought shelter in the station. I have scarcely exaggerated a detail of this curious and absurd adventure. It occurred almost exactly as I have stated it. We actually went into camp in a snowdrift in a desert at midnight in a storm, forlorn and hopeless, within 15 steps of a comfortable inn. For two hours we sat apart in the station and ruminated in disgust. The mystery was gone now, and it was plain enough why the horses had deserted us. Without a doubt, they were under that shed a quarter of a minute after they had left us, and they must have overheard and enjoyed all our confessions and lamentations. After breakfast, we felt better, and the zest of life soon came back. The world looked bright again, and existence was as dear to us as ever. Presently, an uneasiness came over me, grew upon me, assailed me without ceasing, Alas, my regeneration was not complete. I wanted to smoke. I resisted with all my strength, but the flesh was weak. I wandered away alone and wrestled with myself an hour. I recalled my promises of reform and preached to myself persuasively, unbraidingly, exhaustively, but it was all vain. I shortly found myself sneaking among the snowdrifts, hunting for my pipe. I discovered it after a considerable search and crept away to hide myself and enjoy it. I remained behind the barn a good while, asking myself how I would feel if my braver, stronger, truer comrades should catch me in my degradation. At last I lit the pipe, and no human being can feel meaner and baser than I did then. I was ashamed of being in my own pitiful company. Still dreading discovery, I felt that perhaps the further side of the barn would be somewhat safer. And so I turned the corner. As I turned the one corner, smoking, Allendorf turned the other with his bottle to his lips. And between us sat unconscious Baloo, deep in a game of solitaire with the old greasy cards. 
absurdity could go no farther. We shook hands and agreed to say no more about reform and examples to the rising generation. The station we were at was at the verge of the 26-mile desert. If we had pro approached it half an hour earlier the night before, we must have heard men shouting there and firing pistols, for they were expecting some sheep drovers in their flocks and knew that they would infallibly get lost and wander out of reach of help, unless guided by sounds. While we remained at the station, three of the drovers arrived, nearly exhausted with their wanderings, but two others of their party were never heard of afterward. We reached Carson in due time and took a rest. This rest, together with preparations for the journey to Esmeralda, kept us there a week, and the delay gave us the opportunity to be present at the trial of the great landslide case of Hyde versus Morgan, an episode which is famous in Nevada to this day. After a word or two of necessary explanation, I will set down the history of this singular affair just as it had transpired. Chapter 34, about Carson, General Buncombe, Hyde versus Morgan, how Hyde lost his ranch, the great landslide case, the trial, General Buncombe in court, a wonderful decision, a serious afterthought. The mountains are very high and steep about Carson, Eagle, and Washoe Valleys. Very high and very steep. And so when the snow gets to melting off fast in the spring and the warm surface earth begins to moisten and soften, the disastrous landslides commence. The reader cannot know what a landslide is unless he has lived in that country and seen the whole side of a mountain taken off some fine morning and deposited down in the valley leaving a vast, treeless, unsightly scar upon the mountain's front to keep the circumstance fresh in his memory all the years that he may go on living within 70 miles of that place. General Buncombe was shipped out to Nevada in the invoice of territorial officers to be United States Attorney. He considered himself a lawyer of parts and he very much wanted an opportunity to manifest it partly for the pure gratification of it and partly because his salary was territorially meager, which is a strong expression. Now the older citizens of a new territory look down upon the rest of the world with a calm, benevolent compassion, as long as it keeps out of the way. When it gets in the way, they snub it. Sometimes this latter